G'day Space Cadets! In this video, we're going to talk about hypersonic re-entry capsules and the shocks that they create. If you're familiar with space technology, you've probably heard that re-entry vehicles should be shaped like a blunt body to keep the shock wave far away and reduce the heating of the vehicle. Today we're going to talk about the basic physics behind this idea. We'll discuss why the shock is pushed further away by blunt bodies and how that reduces heating. We'll also discuss the limitations of this strategy and why sharper bodies can sometimes have lower heating. A warning, hypersonic aerodynamics is very complex and I will be using some hand wavy explanations here to get the general point across. If you want or need the full mathematical rigor, I suggest getting a copy of Hypersonic and High Temperature Gas Dynamics by John Anderson. A number of the diagrams in this video are also from the book. As we discussed in previous videos, perfectly sharp leading edges are not physically possible, and so in reality we will always have a finite stagnation region at the tip. We can, however, control the size of this stagnation region via varying the geometry of the vehicle's tip. A normal shock occurs immediately before the stagnation region, greatly compressing and heating the incoming gas flow. The pressure, temperature and density in the stagnation region are only a function of the gas itself, the free stream Mach number and the free stream density. It doesn't matter if the vehicle re-entering the atmosphere is a CubeSat or a space shuttle. The tip stagnation point will have the same pressure and temperature at a given combination of speed and altitude. From the point of view of the spacecraft, the gas is flowing towards it at a given velocity and Mach number. Therefore, the gas has a certain amount of kinetic energy relative to the vehicle. For high velocity flows, we can rearrange the kinetic energy into something called the specific enthalpy, which is how many joules of energy each kilogram of the gas has relative to the vehicle. In the stagnation region, this relative velocity is reduced to almost zero, and therefore almost all of the enthalpy must be converted into something else, mostly pressure and temperature. Let's consider a basic example to put the quantities of energy we're talking about into perspective. A vehicle entering the Earth's atmosphere at 8 km per second would experience a gas flow with a relative enthalpy of about 32 megajoules per kilogram. The enthalpy from stagnating one kilogram of this gas would be enough to instantly vaporize about 14 kilograms of water. If you wanted to totally evaporate this same amount of water on your stove at home, you would be waiting hours. Fortunately, only a small percentage of this converted enthalpy is actually transferred to the vehicle as heat, as we will discuss in a later video on thermal protection systems. Let's now consider a re-entry vehicle with a small, flat stagnation region. Think about a 3U CubeSat re-entering the atmosphere with its smallest phase first. If we wanted to, we could evaluate the pressure, temperature and density of the gas in the stagnation region using aerothermodynamic principles. Now remember, the post-shock properties only depend on the pre-shock free stream properties and the Mach number. The next thing to consider is that there will be a certain mass flow rate entering the stagnation region across the normal shock. This flow into the stagnation region must also exit somehow, and it does so by flowing through these gaps here. As it flows around the corner, it will accelerate back to supersonic speeds in the oblique shock region, but this is out of the scope of this video. The thickness of the gap required for a given mass flow rate to exit the stagnation region depends directly on the post-shock pressure and density of the gas. If we increase the size of our satellite, we create a larger normal shock and stagnation region. Since we now have a larger shock area, we also have an increased mass flow rate across the shock. The gas properties behind the shock are still the same though, and so we will need a larger exit area to accommodate the increased mass flow rate. The way this problem is resolved in nature is by the normal shock moving forward to enlarge the exit sections. As we continue making the stagnation region bigger, the shock must get further and further away. The same general idea applies also if the body is curved and we increase the radius. Now let's talk about how this effect can reduce heat transfer to the body. 
This explanation is going to be quite hand wavy and use only very basic fluid mechanics in order to convey the general idea in a video that is less than five hours long. Please refer to the Anderson book for a more rigorous explanation. At the exit region, we have a more or less constant mass flow rate per unit area. The total gap thickness and the total mass flow rate change as the vehicle bluntness is varied, but their ratio remains basically the same. In the stagnation region, the gas is moving slowly and can be treated as an incompressible laminar flow between the vehicle body and the shock layer. As you might know from an intro to fluid mechanics class, the velocity profile of a laminar flow over a flat plate looks something like this. Near the wall, the fluid velocity is zero. The velocity increases gradually in the boundary layer as we move away from the wall until it eventually reaches the free stream velocity outside the boundary layer. The slow moving boundary layer creates a deficit of mass flow, which must be compensated by the free stream moving faster. The slope of the velocity profile in the boundary layer at the wall is what we're interested in. The steeper this gradient is at the wall, the greater the viscous effects and heating of the body. If the shock wave is very close to the body, the flow channel is very narrow and the slow boundary layer takes up a considerable portion of the flow thickness. In order to maintain the average mass flow rate required at the exit section, the free stream portion must move very fast to compensate for the boundary layer deficit. This large variation in velocity creates a steep slope in the velocity profile and therefore increased heating of the body. On the other hand, if we have a large distance between the shock and the body, the deficit from the boundary layer has a much smaller relative effect and the free stream can have a lower velocity, only slightly above the average mass flow rate. We can see now that the gradient of the wall in this case is much lower and therefore the heating is too. Now we can see why blunt bodies reduce the stagnation point heating. It is clear that we should design our re-entry capsules to be as blunt as possible. Not. So far, we've only talked about convective heating, which occurs from a fluid flowing past a surface. We haven't yet talked about radiative heating. Remember, the post-shock gas has a temperature of many thousands of degrees, and since radiation scales with the fourth power of temperature, it can become a big concern at very high speeds. We're generally used to thinking about radiation as a surface phenomenon, where only the size, temperature, and properties of the surface matter. With a radiating gas, we're still concerned about the temperature and the molecular properties, but instead of surface area, we care about the total number of radiating particles. The number of radiating particles increases as the post-shock pressure and density increase, and also when the total volume of the post-shock region increases. Therefore, a very blunt body with a large shock separation distance and large post-shock volume will generate much more thermal radiation than a pointed body under the same conditions. It's worth noting that while the axial shock itself is significantly hotter than the post-shock region, it is incredibly thin and therefore has a negligible volume compared to the post-shock region, and its contribution can generally be neglected. As extreme gas temperatures are required for significant radiative heat transfer to occur, radiative heating only becomes a real concern at superorbital speeds. The Apollo missions returning from the Moon entered the Earth's atmosphere at around 11 kilometers per second, significantly higher than the 7 or so kilometers per second required for low Earth orbit. More than 30% of the total capsule heat load was due to radiation. The heating of the Galileo probe, which entered Jupiter's atmosphere at the ludicrous speed of 47 kilometers per second, was essentially 100% radiative. It should be pointed out that the convective heating of the body was negligible primarily because the rapid heat shield ablation outputs so much cooling gas that the post-shock gases could not even reach the vehicle's surface. Based on these two examples, we would expect to see very different capsule geometries for low Earth orbit re-entry capsules, which will experience mostly convective heating, and for extremely superorbital capsules like the Galileo probe, which experience mostly radiative heating. 
And this is exactly what we observe. If we have a look at Crew Dragon, which visits the International Space Station and other destinations in low Earth orbit, we see a very blunt heat shield. As we discussed earlier, such a blunt heat shield will create a large shock volume with low velocity gradients at the vehicle surface and therefore relatively low convective heating. It will also create a lot of drag at high altitudes so that the spacecraft can slow down gradually with accelerations that won't kill the meat bags inside. When we examine the Galileo capsule, we see a very different geometry. Firstly, the tip radius is much smaller. The normal shock at the tip will occur quite close to the surface of the heat shield, reducing the volume of radiating gas, and therefore reducing the radiative flux to the heat shield. This small shock separation distance does encourage higher convective fluxes, however, at superorbital speeds the radiative flux greatly outweighs the convective flux. The second thing we note is how angled the rest of the heat shield is. Remember, the Galileo probe entered Jupiter at 47 km per second. At these kind of speeds, the deceleration from drag becomes a very significant design concern. Making the heat shield more pointed reduces the drag somewhat. Even with this low drag shape, Galileo experienced a peak deceleration of about 350 Earth Gs. That's all for today's video. I hope you learned something new. We will revisit the concepts discussed here in future videos on wave riders, and in particular, wave riders for aerogravity assists. If you have any feedback, constructive criticism, or you found some mistakes, please leave a comment below. Have a good one!